Hello. Welcome to tonight's Slow Residency MFA in Visual Studies Visiting Artist Lecture by Mike Bray. My name is Jody Cavalier and I am the co-chair of the Low Residency MFA in Visual Studies program. Our three-year program brings students from all across the world to Portland for eight weeks in the summer and one week in the winter. Our students have been here in Portland all week, rigorously working through their research and reflecting on their off-site studio practice. We are very excited to bring Mike Bray um, in as our visiting lecturer this week. Uh, he has a solo show at 1430 Contemporary, which opens tomorrow evening in Southeast Portland. I encourage you all to attend. Um, and I want to take an opportunity to thank those who made this lecture possible. Janine Jablonski, owner and director of 1430 Contemporary, founding chair and now academic dean of PNCA, Tracy Cockrell, my co-chair, Laura Hughes, our wonderful AV team, uh, Alex and Melinda, and my thoughtful and engaged students who have been working hard all week. Um, and now I want to turn it over to my co-chair, Laura Hughes, who will introduce Mike Bray this evening. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We're very thrilled to introduce a lecture by Mike Bray tonight. Um, Jody and I have been following his work for some time, and we're really big fans. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Mike Bray is an artist based in Eugene, Oregon, who is a professor at the University of Oregon, where he got his MFA in 2008. His work blends pop culture influences with sculpture, photography, and video into multimedia installations. He was a recipient of the prestigious Halley Ford Fellowship in 2013. As quoted by the selection panel, quote, he is focused on the ways as spectators, we actively expand and populate cinematic worlds, spinning a keyhole view on a, of a story into something emphatically alive. In addition to the Halley Ford Fellowship, Mike has been awarded um, an Oregon Arts Commission Individual Fellowship and the Joan Shipley Award. Solo exhibitions include Ditch Projects in Eugene, Portland State University, 1430 Contemporary, Crawl Space Gallery in Seattle, and group ex exhibitions include the Grammar Center in Medford, 12128 Boat Space in Portland, Oregon, which is a gallery on a boat for any of you guys that haven't seen that before, it's pretty great. Uh, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in Eugene, the Lumber Room in Portland, Human Resources in LA. Mike is a co-founder and co-director of Ditch Projects, Artist Run Space in Springfield, and I recommend you guys go take a two hour drive out there, it's well worth it. He's also a founding member of the Coast Time Artist Residency in Lincoln City. Mike is represented by 1430 Contemporary and he has an exhibition opening there tomorrow at, at six, 6 to 8 o'clock p.m. So we hope you guys can join us for his opening tomorrow night and thank you again to 1430. Please join me in welcoming Mike Bray. Thanks, Jody and Laura. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks, uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, so I have a show opening tomorrow, and, and the show actually is um, something I think it has been kind of like happening in my head for a little while. And um, my work um, in the past, I've always kind of appropriated and kind of looked at uh, cinematic moments and kind of taken those cinematic moments uh, into my work as like kind of prepackaged uh, information. And this is probably the first time when I haven't done that. And so I'm kind of interested in a way like, you know, that move, uh, why I'm making that move or how that move kind of happened through my work. So I actually kind of gone back a little bit further than I have gone back in a while to talk about work, just to kind of show you, uh, doesn't mean it's gonna be super long, it won't, it'll be a, a normal, um, but yeah, I'll go fast. Um, but just to kind of show like the trajectory, just, you know, I guess maybe I'm almost interested in kind of see how it comes together and some of the pieces I haven't seen for a while. Um, so this first piece um, that I kind of have up is, uh, is based on some work I did uh, around the, uh, the film The Shining. Um, like I said, I like, to, I, I like to look at cinema in kind of a way, maybe I always think of it looking at like a landscape painter, may look, look at the landscape when they're painting. And uh, for me, like as a person that kind of grew up like watching films and kind of like really almost like, like um, developing as a person through films, like I think like, um, like I always thought like when I grew up like the certain type of like woman I wanted was like a Catherine Hepburn kind of woman. You know what I mean? Like I defined so much about myself through films. and. Um, 
and and but one one genre of film I was always never that great with was horror. I was always, but I was fascinated why people were interested in horror. Like, you know, it, I I just didn't have the stomach for it. I guess in a lot of ways. Um, so when I was looking, I would kind of uh, take you know pieces from films in different ways. Um, and the and the Shining, I started watching the Shining and trying to think about when you when you really took away all the violence from the Shining, it was like became this kind of like family drama uh, about like this family that had trouble communicating. And I kind of tried to think about like like relooking at it and and to take those moments and not try to take the violence out. And so it became about taking care of instead of like you know uh, I guess physically uh, assaulting. Um, so this uh, this first uh, piece is called the drag, and um, and it's taken from a scene in the Shining. I'll just kind of show the video while I'm talking. Um, taken from the scene in The Shining where uh, you know, Jack Nicholson is knocked unconscious and dragged into uh, the, a meat locker. Um, I was really interested in the, in the kind of camera movement that was like really um, unusual. It was like from a really strange perspective. Um, how it kind of moved and would pause with him when the, when the person dragging him would kind of pause also. And just kind of, uh, um, one of the ways I've noticed I've, I've started to work is I'll oftentimes have like a certain idea I kind of start with and start working towards. And a lot of times that idea like kind of falls apart. Like there's a lot of failure in my work. <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, when I'm trying to find this, when I have this one specific idea I'm going towards, I always run into some other element that just kind of I didn't notice before. Um, so I became really fascinated just with the movement of, uh, of Jack Nicholson through and the dimension of the tables and table legs in the back of the screen. And, um, and kind of just wanted to like, like recreate it and try to kind of like performatively um, like, you know, and tenderly take Jack Nicholson back and forth in a space. I think this one's from like 2006 or so too. So continuing in the, uh, in the Shining work, which I, I, I probably was really locked into the Shining for like three or four years. Um, one thing I really thought was interesting about that, the previous video, and, and something I, I, I did like think about the tables and the legs of the tables and how like there's like moments where things on the screens would sync with moments in the, in the, in the video, like the legs in, the, in my space. And that became really kind of, um, something I became really kind of interested in, like these kind of moments where people would watch, and I'd watch people look at my work and they looked for moments when things kind of lined up and that's what they, they kind of wanted, that uh, suspension of disbelief. They, they were looking for it. Like, I, I was making work that I thought was kind of like, like um, making it difficult for someone to suspend disbelief, but people just wanted to, to kind of be fooled by the cinematic. Um, and, so, uh, and so I kind of started to explore that idea of like the actual space in the, in the videos and the screens that I'm like, uh, like interacting with and moving, and the spaces that I'm using as like the performative uh, space of, of shooting the videos. I think it's like the right before the moment before, you know, Jack Nicholson comes around the corner kind of thing where I kind of stop it and pull it back, almost kind of saving Scatman in a way. Um, but and this piece too, I think was interesting uh, for me when I made it too, in that I, I have a habit of like, you know, I, got, I really think through like, and I, before I start making, and I, and I do think a lot about um, like thinking and making are really important parts of what I do, but I oftentimes I like, you know, think through every like, you know, I do like multiple iterations just in my head before I start. And, um, and on occasion, though, I kind of like try to take that thinking away and try to get myself just to kind of respond um, to a space or to a moment. So like this, this piece, I remember that um, it was a construction site and it was like they, all the construction crew came in and they tore down all this, all this stuff and, um, and like the two by fours and everything. And they were gonna come back the next morning, probably at 6 a.m. and start again. And so I literally, like when they left, I just kind of waited till they left and I just kind of snuck in and then like set up everything in the stage I wanted to and just filmed all night long. And it was like this kind of great limitation of time that it was, I really enjoyed. Um, now, like previously, I'd kind of been using like the screens and moving the screens around, and um, and I thought about a lot about that kind of like family drama thing and the reenactment, and um, and so I decided that I thought it'd be interesting to kind of uh, restage like the the iconic uh, bathroom scene from The Shining, 
Um, and uh, instead of like making me you know, smash the door, but kind of talk through the door. And um, I tried to keep doing it in different ways and acting it out and acting it out. And, and mainly because I was the person I had access to, not necessarily that I wanted to be in or wanted to think of myself as Jack Nicholson or that character. But um, I, it, it just like, uh, it started to kind of like, uh, um, as I watched all the footage, it became more and more apparent to me that the, the me as an actor, I, I wasn't very good. <laughs> and, and I wasn't getting across what I wanted to get across. But every time I got to the moment where I went up to the door and I was put, you know, where Jack Nicholson puts his face through the door and I just put my face up against the door, I just thought it was kind of like this pathetic, hilarious little moment. And, uh, and thought that I just kind of wanted to focus on that moment. And so um, instead of having it become um, a video piece on its own, I kind of like collapsed the space and kind of recreated parts of the sets. Um, the actual set piece here, like the, the wood is actually, um, is, it's two by fours, but I made, I made the two by fours, so everything's about 75% scale, including me in the, in the print. So if I was standing next to it, I'd just be 25% you know, larger, which kind of gave it, like, I thought it just kind of like strange, like it, it wasn't real, it was like, and it wasn't something on a screen, it was like halfway between the two is what I was kind of, hoping to go towards, and included to the, um, you know, there's, there's the side of the door that I'm on, and there's the bathroom tiles, and they're all kind of happening in a, in a film strip kind of way in the, in the same side, not from, not on the front and the back side. Um, with it too is, uh, I started kind of like really thinking about the objects of film, and this is probably one of the first objects in a, from a film that I made, and, and um, I, I used VHS, um, VHS a lot in my early work, and I was really interested in that idea of like, I think it was Virilio talked about VHS was one of the first moments that people, uh, the viewer really had power over the, over the spectacle of film. Like if you went to a theater, you just had to watch until the, until the film was over. You couldn't pause it and rewind and watch something again. And um, VHS is like this kind of moment where you could, and, like you could make copies for your friends, you can edit down things, like you could like, work with it. And there's really a, a way I was kind of fascinated with. Like as a kid, like I did that quite a bit. Um, and but when you hit VHS, it's like kind of an, it's imperfect, and there'll be these like kind of like moments where if you pause, you'll see like like you know many parts of the of the movement at once. And I was kind of and I thought like just kind of like how I would make these beautiful objects, and. Um, and so I kind of want to think about that act scene and, and not just think about it just as recreation, but take some of the objects out of it. So like this would be the axe I'd be removing from the scene and kind of putting off to the side in the corner. That's, uh, by the way, the, the axe heads are cast aluminum. And accompanying with it was uh, a video piece where I kind of created my own little set, similar set to the piece where uh, Jack Nicholson's being dragged. Instead of, instead of Jack Nicholson, it's me being dragged back and forth in a kind of a similar manner, so kind of replacing my, uh, myself with him. Now, kind of moving on from there, I, I, you know, the, the like horror and violence of horror, and removing the violence of horror, like, I, I, I think, um, I started like to look at, like it, horror wasn't really what I was that that interested in. I, I was kind of you know I liked the idea of horror, but horror just wasn't kind of something that I was that comfortable with. And I think it had a lot of um, subjects that I didn't necessarily want like didn't want to talk about in my work. But I was interested in some of um, some aspects of it, like the like just like that axe swing. I kept looking at it and pausing it. And um, later on, I was watching the film Blow Up. And, and if you guys have ever seen the film Antonioni film Blow Up, there's a really great scene where Jeff Beck, um, who's pictured there, has trouble with his amplifier. And it's a scene where it's the Yardbirds playing. And Antonioni wanted to get like the, the hippest band in the, in the world uh, to kind of play in this scene in the film. And he initially had a band called the In Crowd. And he wanted the, the guy from the In Crowd to smash his guitar in the scene. But then he found out about the Yardbirds, who had just started, and um, and they were they were the, the hottest thing around. And so he got rid of the in crowd, <laughs> and he and he got the the uh, the Yardbirds. But the hilarious thing about it is like Jeff Beck has always played a you know Fender Strat, like like that's just his guitar, right? And so they made the guitars already, these prop guitars for what the the guy from like the in crowd plays. It was like the wrong guitar, and it was and uh, and the more I read about it too, is it was like. Um, they made like multiples of the guitar to kind of to kind of practice smashing them, or to like, so they could smash in just the right way. And in fact, actually, something I totally didn't know is like pretty much every live performance where they smash a guitar, it's like a guitar to smash, which is hilarious. Like Kiss, like they make them so like you know it just breaks the same way every time, you know, which is so funny. You know, it's like this like you think this punk rock rebellious moment, totally not, totally staged. Um, 
But um, so I was kind of interested in these guitars, these like objects that were kind of made for this performance, but you know, were just the wrong objects. Um, and so I looked through the, um, uh, I watched the Antonio film and I paused and paused like every, like one frame every second and created, uh, and created from the pauses all of these 24 guitars. And each guitar is like the aspect ratio is a little askew as like the, as the pause kind of like uh, had them like, you know, you can see some of them are a little bit, it's my little mouse work now. Some are quite small, some are dragged out longer. Uh, they're all kind of different orientations. And once again, my initial inclination is what I thought was like a video performance, just like, like it always felt like a cyclical uh, motion that made so much sense. And so I, uh, and I took myself out because I realized that I shouldn't be in, in my videos. I'm not the person I wanted. And I also thought, started thinking of myself more as a director as opposed to the actor. That's how I related to films in a way. And so um, I got a friend to uh, recreate and we made these, I made these like kind of mock amplifiers and I was going to have him go through and smash all 24 guitars like, you know, and through it. And once again, he, he looked ridiculous too. <laughs> and in fact, we even got like a second guy to try it and it still looked ridiculous. But the guitars, when I made them as objects, I kind of made them thinking that I was going to use them as, as objects too. So there was going to be the performance of smashing them, but then using, using guitars, the guitars also. So in the end, the guitars became kind of the piece. Um, so uh, in the show, and this show was called 24 Frames, was kind of the detrius from, from the uh, guitar smashing and kind of all piled up and through there. And then the uh, amplifiers that were used for the kind of restaging of the set and all the amplifiers were actually kind of like, like created from this still. You can kind of see the top of the amplifier. And there's a, I think there's three shots showing them, shooting them. So I looked at just those shots and made the parts of the amplifiers I could see there. So you can kind of see some different parts there. And, um, and the uh, amplifiers were used in the performance in that like, you know, we did literally smash, still smash all the guitars on the amplifiers. But instead of like showing the action, we just kind of left um, you know, the scratches and marks and tears and the prints that were attached to the to the um, panels as kind of a sign of that action. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm tearing through this. Um, so, uh, um, like, so, so far, like, I guess I've been thinking about horror and that kind of spectacle of like a guitar smash, spectacle of cinema, um, and, and, um, and making objects and images and videos and thinking about objects and images and videos as different kinds of trust in a way, like um, you know, like a, a video we all know can be edited, there can be sound added, it can be you know, reshot multiple times, a photograph, you know, like we all know we can't trust a photograph. Um, but an object I thought was interesting in that, like an object is something that's in our space, and even if it's, we know it's manipulated, but we still trust and understand what it is. So I was thinking about all those different things as far as like, all the, like a, a photo and an image and an object and how they kind of uh, operated. Um, in my work and just just in our in our reality, and it started to make me think about like not like narrative, not just uh, straight narrative films like The Shining or uh, or Blow Up, but to look at uh, documentary also. Um, and so um, the documentary that made the most sense and what really drew me in was um, was um, Give Me Shelter, which is the document uh, documentation of the Altamont Free Concert. You know, the Rolling Stones didn't get to go to Woodstock. They decided they were going to do their own West Coast version, and, and they, you know, with a lot of hubris, didn't plan it very well. They, you know, hired Hell's Angels as security. They kept moving the site, so it wasn't like going to put together very well. The stage that they had initially that they're going to use in one spot, it changed to a new spot, and because of the orientation of where the audience was, and just because the audience was there, and there wasn't the, you know, like there wasn't like enough food, there wasn't enough water, there wasn't you know, like, so everyone just got just you know like really high and really drunk and things really fell apart. You know, like the, the bands, like, you know, the Stones, all the different bands that were going to play, they stopped being the spectacle and the audience became the spectacle. Like they'd be playing and like, uh, you know, uh, Mick Jagger would be playing and like you'd just see a dog walk on stage right past him or, or like the security guard, there'd be this drummer playing, you could see the security would look over and just see that there's a guy just like tripping on LSD, like freaking out, standing behind the drummer, you know, like they, the musicians were playing scared. And, and in a way, like, uh, they say the Rolling Stones when their best performance was at Altamont. But I was really interested in that, like, push and pull of the spectacle. Like, you know, like, uh, an audience will generally stay in a controlled manner because of what they're, you know, because of the spectacle that they're kind of in awe of, right? Um, and so, it, like, in a way, like, Gimme Shelter or, or Altamont was, it was violent and it was dangerous and it was kind of scary, but it was something kind of beautiful, too, about this, about the mass kind of rising up against what, you know, the, the, uh, the structure of, of, uh, of control. 
Um, so, the, um, so I had a show called It Was Never About the Audience. And just a few of the pieces in this show, th this piece is actually two pieces that kind of go together, the photograph and the video on the pedestal. And it's called, uh, it's called Lit, for, Lit to be Filmed, and, or Lit for Film. And uh, that title came from a, um, a New York Times review of, of the movie Give Me Shelter, where um, one thing that famously happened is that one of the security guards of um, one of the security guards from Hell's Angels actually killed someone in the audience. And there was there was a part of the documentary they think they can see a gun, they're not sure, but Hell's Angels said they were pointing a gun. Like this, like the the film grain just kind of gets in the way of you really understanding what's happening. And um, people were kind of like, thought it was horrible that in the end, the Rolling Stones went through and created this kind of documentary, like this Woodstock documentary um, called Gimme Shelter. But the, the documentary is kind of, it's fascinating in that it's like, they're not hiding anything. You know, like uh, the Maisley's brothers did it, and they did this really wonderful job of showing everything that happened, even showing how like, you know, like inept the, the Stones were and all the other musicians were and kind of creating this, this event. But the review, um, in the review, there was a great line where um, the, the reviewer said that the uh, audience was upset about the show and one described the show as being lit to be filmed, not as a performance or not as a stage. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. What does that mean? What does it mean to be kind of lit, for, lit to be filmed? And so I, I recreated, like kind of watching through scenes, I tried to recreate like a, a maquette, like a, a fairly large maquette of, of the lighting to understand like where were the lights and what would be the difference if that was lit to be uh, filmed versus a performance. Um, and so inst I kind of made these, uh, these like set uh, scaffoldings and, and all the lights pointing in all the directions that I could kind of understand from going back and watching through the film. And I actually made that pedestal and the pedestals uh, the, you know, kind of like mimicked from the stage and it's also the stage height which they really, they talked about a lot, it was like 38 inches is the stage height which is why it was so easy for the audience to get up on stage and continually move. And instead of having the whole stage, I just made a pedestal and put like the beefiest record player I could find and, uh, and, a, and a big chunk of fool's gold on top of that record player. So in accompanying with it is the video of the fool's gold spinning in space. Throughout this show, I kind of used uh, fool's gold as this kind of idea of, uh, you know, like looking, looking for, like, you know, trying to, like, l looking at the Rolling Stones is kind of like the answer in a way, but uh, actually the audience, like, being the more honest truth. And when I was thinking about that as a mineral and what that mineral means, um, I kind of stumbled on the idea of obsidian, and obsidian being described as, like, this truthful material, and that, um, it, like, in some, some like, native, uh, native tribes, and it was kind of used in... Um, in like ceremonial um, aspects. And I thought that was really interesting and material to kind of think about as a play back and forth. I was also interested in like, um, like thinking about the obsessive nature of my work and kind of showing how I kind of thought through work. So um, like one thing I, I, I've shown so far, and this is maybe the first one I've shown like this, and this kind of may lead to the show I'm making now, is that I, I kind of started making pieces and every show I had one piece that was kind of about my process. Um, and so this piece was like me thinking about what it meant to kind of blow up or enlarge a, a, like a film strip, to look at it so closely that it, you know, you can't really see what's there. Like, you know, like you're almost just seeing like grain. Um, and so I kind of created this, um, this long film strip like installation of these multiple photographs. And in each photograph, I'm kind of just turning some elements and moving the camera just a little bit. So there's like the subtlest uh, reference to movement. This is the last piece in this show I was going to show, um, and um, I totally cannot remember the name of this one at all. But, um, but uh, this piece, uh, um, once again, there's that pedestal written reference to the stage in Altamont. Um, and between those two black skulls is a pane of two-way mirror. Um, I, I think I was thinking about that kind of, uh, like, like, give me shelter. The Altamont Free Concert was kind of like thought of as the death of the flower power movement. Like, you know, like the drugs got too hard, everything got too wild, and like from there, like, like, you know, like it kind of went downhill. And I, and I wanted to think about that moment and think about kind of making like a, a, a venitas or a reliquary for, for like kind, of, kind of an honor of that moment. And I was thinking about the, the movement of the audience um, through the fourth wall, like you know, from not just being the audience, but moving the fourth wall onto the stage. And so I, I, was, I was interested in making kind of a, um, uh, a moment that kind of like of showing them passing through that wall. It, 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 and as I made it too, I started to think a lot more about like narcissists and you know, like now narcissist like was so infatuated with himself, he like, kind of started looking closer and closer in the water until he drowned. And so, it, which brought it, I think, towards that Venitas kind of uh, um, 
kind of set or kind of arrangement that I thought was really would be an interesting way to to work with it. Now this is a separate piece, and this piece um, I kind of made um, with the intention to show um, in a show a few a, a couple of years ago. And um, and once again too, it was um, if you kind of noticed so far when I've been on showing video piece, I've never really had sound. And um, and I took out sound initially because I was really like obsessed with camera movement, and I kind of wanted to isolate the camera movement down and get people to really focus on that movement. Um, but after a while, when you kind of make a formal choice at one time, and, and that you kind of think helps conceptually, you start to forget why you made that choice way back, you know, and like, wh like wh what would happen if you changed it? And so I started reading quite a bit about um, Foley artists and like the work of like creating sound. And, um, and of course, there's always like, you know, the, if you have, uh, you know, like coconut shells, like, in, like horse hoof sounds and so on. Um, but one of them described in like two or three sources that I found were a description of um, burning black plastic bags cut in strips. And of course, when I read that, it didn't say what it did, but I was like, I gotta try that, right? And, if, and so and like lighting things on fire is always good. And, and so I tried it, and, um, and it made this like really unearthly sound. And, uh, and, it, and it kind of like, it made sense in a way, or what I decided I wanted to do is kind of try, try to take these, these, um, these um, Foley tricks and not make them something that has in the background, but trying to think of them as like, like actions that you do in front of the camera. So you're seeing the action and the sound at the same time. still have no idea what that sound was. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, you get the idea though. Um, I'm gonna try to power through a little bit, a little bit more, but um, the, so uh, uh, following that um, and thinking about the ways I was looking at films and, and researching and looking through and, and kind of understanding what's happening, I was thinking about how much I was relying on what I saw in, on the screen and, and what was shown to me through the screen and sort of thinking about how, I guess I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't the photographer always, I wasn't the, the person holding the camera, I was looking at what I was shown through the camera. Um, and so uh, I started to kind of think about films where it showed um, the cameraman in the film throughout. And, uh, and that, of course, brings back to another, uh, to uh, blow up the Antonioni film I was looking at before, where uh, the uh, premise of the film was a photographer, a fashion photographer, uh, sees, thinks he sees a murder, uh, documents it with a photo, um, and tries to understand if he, could, he can't quite tell, so he keeps blowing it up more and more and more to see if he can see more information but it falls apart. And I thought it was an interesting kind of like how much like my practice it was and how much, but at the same time, even though he's inactive as, as, as in his actions, he was much more active in the creation or in the making than I was as far as receiving the information. Um, so I was, watched the film and uh, took moments from, the, from blow up where the photographer was looking at photos that he took, not when he was taking them, just when he was like looking at them. Um, and I was creating these kind of like, uh, these, these uh, um, kind of boxes, like thinking about like the idea of blowing up film itself and making it more dimensional. And so the boxes were about two inches deep and uh, I would screen print on the front and on the back and add like there's a purple kind of material between those two. And so it, uh, in, a way it, um, in a way it kind of operates, uh, it makes like the viewer more like the camera, like the focus kind of changes as you move, like more blurs happen if you kind of back up like you know, 
some things come in focus, and if you go a little bit closer, other things kind of fall out of focus, which I was kind of I've always kind of thought about the idea of making the making the audience kind of move when they're looking at work, just like you know how it's sculpture, you can't stand still, you have to move throughout, and it's something I've always tried to, to happen in either in the work itself or an installation. Um, with it, you notice the photographer was uh, holding a Nikon F camera, and you see that little teeny triangular thing on the top. That was one of the devices that made uh, those that kind of camera like 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 really boom, and uh, and that device was was a pentaprism that um, that took the the photo that used to be upside down and made it right side up, and it was small enough and at small off scale, so it was light and people could carry it around with them, and it really made photography really change in a way. So uh, I wanted to make an object that was this kind of a. Uh, um, you know, kind of, kind of, an, like, like, like exalting that moment, or like something to, to, uh, to, to kind of like show that object. Instead of making it a functional pentaprism, which, which I always like to have a little bit of failure, I, um, I used instead of actual mirror or making it a solid object, I used two-way mirror. So it didn't actually help see things better. It actually conflated and abstracted the space more. I'm going to skip through a couple for the sake of time. Uh, and that brings, I guess, to, to the show. I'm just going to show a couple of pieces that I'm installing for the show tomorrow. Totally, you can recognize that pedestal. It was just in my studio when I took the photo, right? Um, so it is not part of the piece, really. But, um, but the show I'm making now is, is a lot more, it doesn't have that narrative moment. It, it, um, it's about in, you know it's about just like how light moves through that system of optics when we're when we're creating those images, and just kind of like almost like a, it almost has like a it's almost like a, a bit of bad science I guess in a way, um, where once again I'm not like kind of making things work better I'm almost making things work worse by asking like questions that are kind of outlandish I guess, um, but this piece um, this piece I'm totally blanking on the name of it um, but came from I was thinking about optics and thinking about optics quite a bit. And while I was thinking about optics, I was like looking at, you know, like I'm always looking and reading about other work, and, and I was looking at uh, Gordon Matta Clark's work and saw he had a piece called Conical Intersect. You guys know Gordon Matta Clark. He, and he cut like numerous circles and half circles in this one, uh, in a space, and, then, and he would always document those pieces. And looking at the, the documentation, you almost kind of can't understand what's happening. But look, when I was looking at it, and I was kind of had optics so much in my mind, I started thinking about how all those series of holes look like the series of lenses that happen in optics, and thinking about what would happen if I tried to create that as an optic system. And so that's uh, this piece came from, and uh, this would be the uh, the the you know the yang to that yin, where it's uh, the same circles, but instead of uh, like creating an opening where light pass through, it's. Uh, it's flags that are stopping the light down as the, the light moves through them. Okay, I think I have a couple more. Well, I'm, I'm really pushing it, but I've got a few minutes, I think. And uh, I did wanna talk, there's a little detail there. I did wanna talk a little bit about another part of my practice that I kinda think is uh, really important to me, and that's uh, the community aspect. Um, I kinda came from, I was a musician before, I was an artist, and as a musician, there was always that, I, I loved that, uh, the camaraderie of like you know sharing equipment and going on tours and someone using your practice stuff and setting up shows, and um, and I and I uh, met a group of friends like-minded artists who all had that similar experience, and we wanted to create like a space or we thought like you know like we can kind of like act in a similar way, and, like we all kind of met and got along because of records you know and because of like you know obsessive collection. And we, uh, we looked around town for quite a bit down in Eugene and eventually found our first space. We've actually had two spaces. And this is the first one, and um, this is back in like 2008. It has a little timestamp there. Um, and, uh, and it was this like kind of dilapidated uh, old sawmill uh, warehouse where we literally kind of, uh, somehow someone's always bending over in everyone else's pictures. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> And we, uh, and we went in and we basically kind of like remade the space and we left, we wanted it to kind of still be like what the space was like, so we left half of it raw and half of it, uh, and we made half of it white. And we really thought like, okay, the white walls where, the, where the, the flat work and the photos and the paintings will go and on the other wall, that's where sculpture was gonna happen. But everyone went to the white walls, you know. Um, but the other thing about it was interesting is we also thought it was gonna be something that we were gonna do it and then we probably were gonna get like shut down like really fast, mo most likely arrested. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it didn't happen that way. In fact, it, it, 
it, it was strangely successful. Like we made this space and super naively, like, like we made this space and we're like, all right, let's, let's contact some people to do a show. And we uh, made this list and then we thought like, you know, let's ask, like, like let's ask our A-list first. People are totally gonna say no and then go to the like, people that we know will do it. And, um, and we went to our A-list and everybody said yes which was so amazing to me that in Eugene, Oregon, which, come on, it's Eugene, Oregon, that people were coming from LA and New York and Toronto and all over, all over the country to come and do a show in the space. And it became just, it was just kind of a wonderful experience. Like um, everyone being there for the installations, everyone helping the artists kind of like put their shows up. And, and even though we weren't all, all able to offer like money and they would generally pay their own way and stuff like that, like every artist that came through just became this like kind of like part of the community and kind of built from that. And it became these really wonderful, uh, the openings were really kind of like kind of great in a way too. Now Ditch does show uh, as far as like artwork goes, I think we've had about like 80 shows and shown like about 175, 180 artists so far. Um, I think there's been 24 members. I'm the only one left from the original, original crew of, of members. Um, I think we have right now like, and we've had as much as 12 and as little as four members. And everything's funded just through dues. It's like a club. Uh, we've 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 did do one time a fundraiser, and I do, we are gonna finally do our own fundraiser. But the one fundraiser we did, which was which was epic, but we lost like two hundred dollars. But it was <laughs> it was awesome, you know. <laughs> it was like the best fundraiser you ever went to that did not make any money. Um, but we show uh, uh, work from people all over. But also members do show. Also, this is, this is Donald Morgan. Um, uh, we generally uh, we generally try not to curate. Like when the artist comes in, like where we think we don't curate, that we don't ever really we don't say to them what we like from their work, or what we want. We always kind of just give them the opportunity and say like, you know, like we want you to do what you want to do, and how can we help, and uh, try to let them make all the decisions. Um, this is a, um, a recent show, um, and it has an artist from the region and from out that side of the region, like Diana Thader, um, is up there, and then Tanias Farsi, who's a, a, a artist down here also, um, but is a, it was called uh, Slow Burn. It was last year. Um, we also um, thought, Ditch Project thought it'd be really great in that everyone kept getting award, giving awards and we thought we should make our own award too. And, uh, and so we thought we're gonna do this, we're gonna do it every year, but we're, 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 we're a club where we're paying our own dues so we totally didn't have the money. But we pooled together all the money we had and we made up an award called the Northwest Art Award. <laughs> And we contacted, like, and we made a list of like a hundred people that were like big art people, and we're like, we're going to contact those people and ask them, and we're going to say, all you have to do is give us a name and a and an email, and then to nominate someone, we'll contact that person, and they can, you know, and like literally like ninety out of a hundred people responded, and uh, it was an amazingly successful thing, and and I think we we barely had that much money, like about. I think we gave her like about a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, but uh, Amy Yao is the artist here, and she was the uh, uh, the uh, the Art by Northwest Award winner, the one and only, because we couldn't afford it after that. <laughs> I, and I do believe the funny thing is that all this work, and she uh, with the Art by Northwest Award, she not only got money and showed at Ditch, but she also spent time at Coast Time, which was a uh, some members of Ditch are part of Coast Time and some are not. So she stayed at Coast Time for two months. She showed at uh, she showed at um, at a, um, what do you call it, a Ditch. And then a lot of the work she made at Coast Time and showed at Ditch, she then took to Europe for a show. And so I think one of the photos that like, we documented for the show actually was on like, the cover of Flash art, which is hilarious, I think, that a, a Ditch project, it wasn't like, labeled as that, you know, but it just like, ended up on a major magazine cover. And then Coast Time is the other um, project I'm part of. And Coast Time is an artist residency. It's, um, it's a small house that's similar to maybe like your, your, your cool uncle would have. Um, there's a lot of wood paneling and um, a, a fun little stove, a, of course a record collection because that's part of what we're all about. And we converted a two car uh, garage into a studio and made a wood shop and um, kind of initially opened it up like as far as word of mouth. And that's kind of similar to what we did with Ditch too. We didn't advertise very much, we just kind of asked friends and then it just kind of grew from there. And interestingly, too, it's like a totally, uh, we've been big believers in the idea of it being no cost. We don't like to, we don't have anyone pay to apply. We don't, like, like we hate to pay to apply to things, so why would make someone else do that? And we don't make people that come and stay pay either. We ask that they donate a piece, and, you know, because we say maybe we'll do for a fundraiser, but we actually just usually hang the work in the space. So the work is becoming more and more uh, cluttered with artwork. 
Um, and once again, like artists from all over the country. And in fact, too, like now that the word has kind of gotten out about it, um, it's really been fascinating to see how um, like this is last this last call and we do kind of seasonal calls, um, like we had like, I think like 150 applicants and from like everywhere, like people like, especially during the summertime, we do the summer call, like people want to get out of New York and LA or, or, or even come away from Europe for some reason to go to the Oregon coast. So um, another like accidentally successful thing, you know, as part of community that, that I'm, I'm super excited about. Well, thanks. Um, I am happy to answer any questions. No big deal, I'm, it's cool. I think we're getting tamales after. So are you still doing video? Are you, what, you know, you just Switch to objects? Away or what? No, I do uh, um, every, uh, so am I still doing video? Yes, yeah. uh, every, sh like when I'm kind of working, I do, I jump between mediums, you know, like, uh, and so uh, m most things, uh, most shows will have probably a little bit of every medium, but like uh, sometimes, I, or like, you know, it might have video and sculpture and, and photo. Uh, sometimes one of those is not included. Like the show now doesn't have any photo. I don't think it's all just sculpture and video. Okay, yeah, um, I think I, like, the two ways I think failures happened in my work is that, um, I, I think I was talking about failure in my process, where like a lot of times when I'm thinking through the work and I have this like really like, like exacting, like direct thing, this is what I'm going towards, like there's generally a failure in me getting there, you know, like, uh, the, like it, I get diverted, uh, like the, what I wanted to do turns out to be kind of terrible or it doesn't work. But something in that neighborhood ends up being, you know, kind of like, I guess in a way, like losing a little bit of control. And, and like, and it, it's something I've realized I've had to kind of build into my work and in that I think I like to be super tight and control everything. And the more and more I've like been making work, the more and more I've kind of like, I'm going to set up all these sets of things. And, and I guess it's not like failure as much as like just let the chance happen. And like kind of like the, there's a point where I have to kind of like, I create like a, like a system or a set of rules and then and then just kind of roll the dice and see what happens with it. And so, and that's, uh, and that's been something I've kind of become more and more comfortable with. But the other amount of the type of failure I think that I, or like, uh, like failure that happens in my work is that I'll, I'll make objects that seem like they should function in some way and they don't, you know, like that, like that pentaprism that I had that was on the side, it, it should, you know, like it's, it's an object that made, was made to invert and correct an image and it just distorts and ruins the image, you know, so. So in, that, in those instances, I'm kind of purposely making things to kind of like uh, that don't work. Like I, I think I said bad science in that in a way, and that's sometimes the way I think of it too. No, no pressure, I'm good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, ter I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an over editor, um, uh, as my gallerist can tell you. Um, I kind of like usually make a lot of work and then try to edit down to the things that seem to work the best, and then I just keep editing and changing and editing and changing. And so sometimes I might, I think for the show here now, I think I made like, you know, like nine pieces or something like that, but I think only like five are gonna be in it maybe. So it, it ends up being kind of like what, you know, like there, there is a, like the decision about like, you know, like which pieces work and like the pieces individually maybe I might like, but then as a group, like what, like how are they kind of like getting across the, the bigger idea that I kind of wanted them to kind of respond to. And is like, are two pieces doing the same thing? You know, that kind of thing, like is how I kind of usually work through it. Yes. We have two questions. Uh, first, what I'm looking at right now. Mm. And Mm -hmm. um, there's something like fool's gold suddenly appeared and then like you handmade these two by fours or 
something very specific about those things. Uh -huh. um, and even video and in community also becomes kind of a material, actually, in what you're up to. And so I wait with you to talk about materiality. Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, you know, there's that idea of medium specificity, you know, which I know is totally uncool and everyone's like super lame, you know, like, and like, but I kind of like it, you know, and I kind of like to think about, um, like, I'm definitely not medium specific and I wish I was, you know, sometimes because like it is really, you know, like when you have an idea that brings you to something that you don't know, like you, like you, you have to either teach yourself it or, or get someone else to make it and then you have to really, tr if you ever get someone else to make something for you, you kind of understand how difficult that can be to get them to do what you want. Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways, um, like I've, I've generally ended up teaching myself how to do those things. And then, and I think that's where I, I think I mentioned earlier where I think uh, um, like ideas are really where things start for me and there's a lot of idea, like, like a lot of like, you know, like my sketchbook is generally not um, pictures, you know, like it's generally lists of ideas and like how they link together. And then, um, but then when I do start making, when I do decide to start making, it's like the making is actually in a way where like maybe those editing decisions and so on start to happen. And like the making becomes like, I think like, you know, like where all those different ideas that were kind of like just at list on the page start to kind of balance and interact in a way. Yeah, and this picture actually is totally not my work. It's, um, it's uh, at the artist residency. These are a few images at Coast Time that artists made while there. So this is uh, Phoebe Berglund, and, and this is, um, I totally got cut off, but it's a wooden tripod made in the wood shop by Peter Happel Christian, and this one is also too. I think it's paper, photo paper he's exposing in the sunlight. Did you have a second part to that question? Or? No, no, okay. Yeah, you know, I think um, I do. Um, I, I do think making could be you know, like, like uh, definitely could be influenced in that. I do think um, making too. I like the idea of making being communal, um, especially. I do think like in some ways, like you know, like I still really do enjoy ditch projects. But when ditch projects first started, the community of people that it started with was. Uh, um, we would, you know, I'd say have an idea like I want to build a, an entire staircase that's to, you know, that's to scale but like diminishes in size as it goes up. Would you guys help me? I'll buy the beer and, and it would really come together. And another person might say, I want to put cars on poles. Would you stand under the car with a pole? <laughs> and we would totally be like, yeah, you know, like, and there was a, and it meant in a way that um, there was like this kind of, um, it was you're making and you're thinking through things. There's someone that's in charge and that, that's their idea and they're re re but we were all kind of helping and I think it kind of made um, the uh, kind of communal part of making and, uh, and kind of pushing each other to kind of make things bigger and like beyond what your scope would be or could be. Yeah, yeah. One thing too, actually, was really um, one time. Uh, uh, you know who James Elkins is? When I was in grad student, uh, a grad student, he gave this lecture, and I went to it, and I thought it was hilarious because James Elkins is really brilliant, but he's kind of a jerk, right? And everyone was so put off by his lecture that we had this like grad student meet and greet kind of thing, where like they're like, you can go and talk to him and like that, and nobody showed up but me. <laughs> like everyone was like so annoyed at him, and so then it was like me and James Elkins, and he, and like, and then we just kind of like. <laughs> And we just kind of hung out, you know? And so then he's kind of like, what do you want to know? And I totally was like, I don't know. I, I could ask this guy anything. And somehow, like, we got on studio practice. And he started talking a lot about how one of the, the best things an artist can do is have a, have a, like, put yourself in a place where you have a studio practice close to people and then, and then have that change every, you know, three, two, three, five years. And so new people are coming and seeing their work and you're seeing their work. And inherently, that's just kind of what Ditch does, you know what I mean, too, because as those members kind of come and go, which they do quite often, like I'm, I'm always around different people and seeing different people's work. And they're seeing mine, too, which I think is really great. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much.